You can bend, stretch, walk, run, and jump. Similarly, all other living organisms exhibit movement, which is one of their characteristic features. However, movement in plants is different from that in animals. The simplest form of movement is protoplasmic streaming as seen in unicellular organisms like the amoeba. Some organisms show movement of cilia, flagella and tentacles while many others are able to move their eyelids, tongue, jaws, hands and legs. Sometimes movement may result in a change of location or place. Such voluntary movement is called locomotion. The different types of locomotory movements are swimming, walking, running, climbing and flying. Moreover, in some animals, the structures used for locomotion also help in other movements. In the paramecium, cilia are used for locomotion as well as to draw food inside the cytopharynx. Similarly, in the hydra, tentacles are used for locomotion and to capture prey. Thus, locomotion and movement by an organism are usually studied together. In fact, all locomotion is movement, but all movement is not locomotion. The three main types of movement in human cells are amoeboid, ciliary and muscular. Amoeboid movement is seen in some specialized cells such as macrophages and white blood cells. This movement is produced by pseudopodia due to protoplasmic streaming. Moreover, Cytoskeletal elements like microfilaments are also involved in this type of movement. Another type of movement is ciliary movement, which occurs in most internal tubular organs lined by ciliated epithelium. One such example of ciliary movement is seen in the trachea where the cilia move in a coordinated manner to remove dust particles and foreign substances inhaled while breathing. Another example is the movement of the egg through the female reproductive tract, which is lined by cilia. The third type of movement is muscular movement, which is seen in the eyelids, tongue, jaws, hands and legs. The contractile muscles help in body movements and locomotion of the organism. Moreover, locomotion is brought about by the coordination of the muscular, skeletal and neural systems. Thus, living organisms move from one place to another as well as exhibit different types of movement such as amoeboid, ciliary and muscular movement of the eyelids, tongue, jaws, hands and legs. Muscles play an important role in body movements as well as the movement of internal organs. Without muscles, it would be impossible to bend, stretch, walk, or perform any activity. In fact, muscles constitute about 40 to 50 percent of body weight in adults. 
Muscle is a specialized tissue that originates in the mesoderm. Interestingly, it is the only tissue in your body that has special properties like contractility, extensibility, elasticity, and excitability. Muscles can be classified based on their location, appearance, and nature of regulation of their activities. Based on their location, muscles are classified into three types, namely skeletal, visceral, and cardiac. Skeletal muscle tissues are attached to the bones of the body by collagen fibers called tendons. These muscles are striated or striped and are also referred to as voluntary muscles as they are under the control of the nervous system. Skeletal muscles help in locomotion and different body postures. Another type of muscle are visceral muscles. They are found in the inner walls of hollow visceral organs such as the alimentary canal and reproductive tract. In contrast to skeletal muscles, these muscles are unstriated or smooth and involuntary. These muscles help to carry food through the digestive tract and the meats through the genital tract. The third type of muscle is the cardiac muscle, which is found only in the heart. Cardiac muscle cells are branched, striated, involuntary, and contain a single nucleus. Several cardiac muscle cells assemble in a branched manner to form a cardiac muscle. All these three types of muscles have a complex structure. Let's take a look at the structure of a skeletal muscle. Each skeletal muscle consists of many muscle bundles called fascicles that are held together by a collagenous connective tissue layer called fascia. Each muscle bundle consists of many muscle fibers where each fiber exhibits a syncytium condition which means the sarcoplasm contains several nuclei. Did you know that the parts of a muscle fiber have been given special names? For instance, the plasma membrane is called the sarcolemma, the cytoplasm is known as the sarcoplasm, and the endoplasmic reticulum is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a storehouse of calcium ions which are important for muscle contractions. Each muscle fiber consists of several myofibrils that are parallelly arranged. When viewed under an electron microscope, these myofibrils show alternate light and dark bands. These striations are due to the alternate distribution of two important proteins, actin and myosin. The light band contains actin and is known as isotropic band or I band, whereas the dark band contains myosin and is known as anisotropic band or A band. Both actin and myosin are rod shaped proteins arranged parallel to each other as well as to the longitudinal axis of the myofibrils. However, myosin filaments are thicker compared to actin filaments and they are therefore also called thick and thin filaments respectively. They are alternately arranged throughout the length of the myofibrils. Each A-band is bisected by a thin fibrous membrane called the M-line to which the thick filaments are attached. Similarly, the center of each I-band is bisected by an elastic fiber called the Z-line, to which all the thin filaments are firmly attached.
The portion of the myofibril that lies between two successive Z lines is called the sarcomere, which forms the functional unit of a muscle contraction. At rest, the ends of the thin filaments partly cover the ends of the thick filaments, leaving the central part of the thick filaments uncovered, which is called the H zone. The biochemical study of the two proteins, actin and myosin, show that both have a complex structure. Each actin or thin filament consists of two F or filamentous actins helically coiled to each other. Each F actin is a polymer of monomeric G or globular actin. These F actins also have two filaments that run closely throughout their length. These filaments are made of a protein called tropomyosin, which bears another complex protein called troponin at regular intervals. In a resting state, a subunit of troponin covers the active binding sites for myosin on the actin filaments. Similarly, each myosin or thick filament is a polymerized protein. It is made up of many monomeric proteins called meromyosins. Each meromyosin consists of two important parts, a globular head with a short arm and a tail. However, the globular head and arm is heavier than the tail and is therefore called heavy meromyosin or HMM, while the tail is called light meromyosin or LMM. The HMM component projects at regular distances at an angle from the surface of the myosin filament and is called the cross arm. The head has binding sites for actin and ATP. Additionally, it has an active ATPase enzyme that breaks down the ATP into ADP plus inorganic phosphate, thereby releasing energy. Although the human body has about 650 muscles, in every physical action, whether blinking or running, there is an interplay of muscles as well as complex proteins. Muscle is a special organ that transforms chemical energy into movement. How do you think our muscles contract when we smile, jump or cycle? The mechanism of muscle contraction is well understood by the sliding filament theory. According to this model, muscle fibers contract when thin or actin filaments slide over the thick or myosin filaments. To start a muscle contraction, the central nervous system or CNS sends a signal via a motor neuron. The motor neurons, along with the connected muscle fibers, form a motor unit. In fact, the junction between a motor neuron and sarcolemma of the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction or motor end plate. When a neural signal reaches the motor end plate, it releases a neurotransmitter called Acetylcholine. This neurotransmitter generates an action potential in the sarcolemma which spreads into the muscle fiber, causing the release of calcium ions in the sarcoplasm. The calcium ions further bind to a subunit of troponin on the actin filaments which causes the troponin to change conformation and move the tropomyosin. This unmasks the active sites on actin for myosin to bind to it after consuming energy released by ATP hydrolysis. Myosin binds to actin to form a cross bridge. These cross bridges are very important for muscle contraction.
they pull the attached actin filaments to the center of the A band. Moreover, the Z line attached to the actins is also pulled inwards, shortening the sarcomere, thereby causing a muscle contraction. During the contraction, the I bands are reduced, whereas the A bands retain their length. Interestingly, the filaments do not change in length but merely slide over one another during a contraction. The myosin then releases ADP and inorganic phosphate to go back to its relaxed state, after which a new ATP binds to the myosin head and the cross bridge is broken. The myosin head again hydrolyzes ATP and forms a cross bridge. The stages of cross bridge formation, rotation of myosin head and cross bridge breakage are repeated with different or new actin molecules to cause further sliding. The process repeats till calcium ions are pumped back into the sarcoplasmic cystine, resulting in the masking of actin filaments. This causes the Z lines to return to their original relaxed position. In fact, the repeated activation of muscles may lead to the accumulation of lactic acid due to the anaerobic breakdown of glycogen, causing muscle fatigue. Muscles can be of two types. One, those that undergo aerobic respiration and two, those that depend on anaerobic process for energy. Muscles that respire aerobically are also called red fibers. They are thus named because these muscles contain a red pigment called myoglobin that stores oxygen. These muscles also have several mitochondria that consume the stored oxygen for ATP production. On the other hand, muscles that show anaerobic activity are called white fibers. They are thus named because they have very little myoglobin. They are high on sarcoplasmic reticulum but possess few mitochondria. Consequently, they use anaerobic energy processes. All muscles, however, irrespective of showing aerobic or anaerobic activity, contract via the sliding filament mechanism. Have you ever wondered how a boneless body would look? It would be a shapeless bag, making it difficult to move from one place to another. Our skeletal system gives shape to our body, and the muscular system helps in movement. The adult skeletal system consists of 206 bones and a few cartilages. Did you know that a newborn baby has around 300 bones, which fuse as the baby grows, resulting in 206 bones in an adult? Both bone and cartilage are specialized connective tissues. However, bone has a hard, non-pliable matrix due to the presence of rich calcium salts, while cartilage has a pliable matrix due to chondroitin salts. The skeletal system has two main divisions, the axial and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton includes the basic central framework of our body, while the appendicular skeleton includes the bones of the limbs and their supporting girdles. The axial skeleton consists of 80 bones, which include the skull, vertebral column, ribs and sternum. The skull has two sets of bones, cranial and facial. The eight cranial bones fuse to form a cranium or brain box, while the fourteen facial bones form the face. 
The skull also includes a U-shaped hyoid bone and two ear ossicles, one on either side. Each ear ossicle consists of three tiny bones, malleus, incus and stapes. The skull also has a large hole called the foramen magnum through which the spinal cord after emerging from the brain continues into the vertebral column. The skull articulates with the vertebral column with the help of two occipital condyles. The vertebral column has three main functions. It protects the spinal cord, supports the head and serves as the point of attachment for the ribs. It consists of 26 differently shaped bones called vertebrae. Each has a central hollow portion called the neural canal through which the spinal cord passes. The vertebrae are divided into five groups according to the region they occupy. The neck region has seven cervical vertebrae followed by 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 1 sacral and 1 coccygeal. In adults, the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae unite to form the sacrum and coccyx respectively. In fact, the first two cervical vertebrae called the atlas and the axis allow nodding and rotating movements of the head. There are 12 pairs of ribs, where each rib is a flat bone attached dorsally to the thoracic vertebrae. The first seven pairs of ribs are called true ribs as they are attached dorsally to the thoracic vertebrae and ventrally to the sternum by means of hyaline cartilage. The eighth, ninth and tenth pairs of ribs are called false ribs or vertebrochondral ribs. These ribs are not attached directly to the sternum, but they join the seventh rib with the help of hyaline cartilage. The last two pairs are called floating ribs as they are not attached to the sternum. The ribs along with the thoracic vertebrae and sternum form the rib cage which protects vital organs like the heart and lungs. Thus, the axial skeleton consists of 80 bones including the skull, vertebral column, ribs and sternum. The remaining 126 bones form the appendicular skeleton, which includes the bones of the limbs and their supporting girdles. Interestingly, each limb consists of 30 bones. The bones of the forelimb or hand include the humerus, radius and ulna, eight carpals or wrist bones, five metacarpals or palm bones and 14 phalanges. The bones of the hind limb or leg consist of the femur or thigh bone, tibia and fibula, seven tarsals or ankle bones, five metatarsals and fourteen phalanges. Another bone called the patella or kneecap is found on the ventral side of the knee. The remaining six bones form the girdle bones which articulate with the limb bones to the axial skeleton. There are two girdles, the pectoral or shoulder girdle and the pelvic or hip girdle. Each half of the pectoral girdle consists of a flat, large, triangular scapula and a curved, slender, clavicle or collarbone. The scapula is situated between the second and seventh ribs on the dorsal side of the thorax. It has a slightly elevated ridge called a spine, which projects as a flat expanded process called the acromion. 
Below the acromion is a cup-shaped cavity called the glenoid cavity, into which fits the head of the humerus to form the shoulder joint. In addition, the acromion articulates with one end of the clavicle to form the acromioclavicular joint, while the other end connects to the upper part of the sternum. The pectoral girdle plays an important role in the movement of the arms. The other girdle is the pelvic girdle, which consists of two coxal or hip bones. Each coxal bone consists of three bones, the ilium, ischium and pubis. These bones fuse to form a cavity called the acetabulum, into which fits the head of the femur or thigh bone. The two halves of the hip bones connect dorsally to the sacrum, while these bones meet ventrally with the help of fibrous cartilage to form the pubic symphysis. The pelvic girdle not only supports the limb bones, but also protects the abdominal organs like the reproductive organs and urinary tract. In fact, the female pelvis is wider than the male pelvis to facilitate childbirth. The bones of our body articulate in a way that provides a framework to our body, protect our internal organs and help in body movements. The point at which two bones or a bone and a cartilage make contact is called a joint. These joints play an important role in the movement of the bony parts of our body as well as in locomotion. However, their movability depends on various factors such as the force exerted by the muscles, weight and act of fulcrum, where the joint acts as the fulcrum. Depending on how bones are connected to each other, joints are classified into three major types, fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. Fibrous joints do not allow any movement and are also referred to as immovable joints. For example, the cranial bones, which fuse end to end with the help of fibrous connective tissues to form the cranium. Another type is the cartilaginous joint, in which bones are joined with the help of cartilage. This joint is found between the adjacent vertebrae in the vertebral column, which permits limited movement. The last type is the synovial joint, which is characterized by the presence of a lubricating fluid called synovial fluid, filled in a synovial cavity between the articulating surfaces of the two bones. These joints allow a considerable degree of movement. There are several types of synovial joints, such as the ball and socket joint between the humerus and scapula, hinge joint between the ulna and humerus, pivot joint between the atlas and axis vertebrae, gliding joint between the carpals and the saddle joint between the carpal and metacarpal of the thumb. In this way, the skeletal and muscular systems function in a perfectly coordinated manner. However, over a period of time, these systems may begin to show wear and tear or exhibit some disorders. One such disorder is myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disorder that affects the neuromuscular junction characterized by fatigue, weakening and paralysis of the skeletal muscles. Muscular dystrophy is also common and is characterized by the progressive degeneration of skeletal muscle fiber. It is considered a genetic disorder. Another disorder, tetany, causes rapid spasms in the muscles due to calcium deficiency, whereas 
Arthritis is the inflammation of joints, a disorder commonly seen in elderly people. Elderly people also suffer from osteoporosis, which is characterized by a decrease in bone mass, which increases the chances of fractures. It is caused by a decrease in the level of estrogen and is therefore more common in women. Gout is another disorder which results in the inflammation of joints due to the accumulation of uric acid crystals. It is essential to observe a healthy diet and lifestyle so that the skeletal and muscular systems can function efficiently.